Welcome to ECE 165. This is lecture eight, where we'll be discussing the topic of combinational logic. So it turns out that we've actually been discussing combinational logic all along, um, but we're going to pay specific uh, attention to the nomenclature of what we mean by combinational logic, and then we'll discuss a few different types of combinational logic in this lecture. So with that, let's go ahead and put our section title here, combinational logic. Now this is going to be indeed a section uh, header here, so I'm gonna double box it. And if you're following along uh, in the book, this would be West and Harris, chapter nine, or Rabai, Chandrakasan and Nikolic, chapter six. Okay, so what do we mean by common, combinational logic? Well, it turns out it's, it's basically what we've been doing the entire time. Okay, combinational logic. What we mean by combinational logic is we have some inputs that go into our logic cell. This is some logic circuit. Okay, and these create outputs exactly as we've been studying. So what this means is the outputs are a function of the inputs. All right, not rocket science. So the reason I'm being very explicit here is because I want to contrast it to the other form of logic, which is called sequential logic. Okay, and the difference between combinational and sequential logic is the following. We still have our inputs. They go into some sort of logic circuit. And they create outputs. So far, what we're describing is exact, exactly the same. But then some of these outputs will go back. There will be some sort of notion of state or some memory. And then the output of this state will feed back to the inputs. Okay, and so what we mean by this is the outputs are now a function of the inputs and of the previous inputs. Okay, so this is the difference. We're not going to talk about sequential logic right now. I'm going to say this is covered later on in this course. What we're going to focus on is combinational logic, and specifically we want to talk about all sorts of different ways that we can build combinational logic structures. So within the overall family of combinational logic, there's, there's multiple different types. Uh, the first type we're going to talk about is called static CMOS. So the design of static CMOS circuits. So what do we mean by static CMOS? Well, for lack of a better way to describe this, we say as opposed to dynamic CMOS, which we will discuss later. So don't worry, uh, you know, we, I am making these definitions based on things that we haven't studied yet, but, uh, uh, but we will get there, uh, don't worry. So as opposed to dynamic CMOS, the output in static CMOS is always, and as engineers, we should probably never use the word always because always is never always correct. That pun was not intentional. Uh, static CMOS is always connected to VDD or ground uh, via a low resistance path. Okay, so just like the circuits we've been building, when we build our gates, we assume that we're connecting the output to either VDD or ground through the pull-up network or the pull-down network. Now, I put always with an asterisk there simply because, well, we know there's a transition period where neither of or where both of the transistors are on or depending on the threshold voltage, perhaps neither of the transistors are, are totally inverted. And so it's not 
technically always connected to VDD or ground, but when we are displaying a valid logic level, we are connected to ground. Now within static CMOS, we have a su su several sub variants. Now the first one that I want to discuss is called static complementary CMOS. So this might seem like a, a little bit like calling a ATM machine, even though M stands for machine. We're saying static complementary, complementary metal oxide semiconductor. It does sound a little funny, uh, but this is the name for, for the logic family that, uh, that, that uh, we've actually been using all along. Okay, so this is what we've been using all along. Okay, so for example, if we want to build a NAND gate, we have our pull up network composed of PMOS devices and our pull down network composed of NMOS devices. This is inputs A and B, A and B, and then this is the output Y. Okay, so I want to take a little bit of a deeper dive into why we build our static complementary um, gates in the way that we've told you to. Okay, so the, the first thing I want to, to ask uh, is a question is why do we use PMOS for the pull up network and NMOS for the pull down network? Why did we insist that that was something that we wanted to do? Well, it turns out there's a very good answer for this. Okay, so let's look at the pull up network as an example. Let's imagine we, um, you know, stick to this lesson and we use a PMOS. Okay, so this is our pull up network. When the pull up network is on, the PMOS gate is grounded. VSG is therefore equal to VDD. So we can say here that VSG um, is equal to VDD. So we have good drive strength across this transistor and it's trying to pull up some capacitance CL. This is node V out here. It's trying to pull up some capacitance. Okay, so what's gonna happen because that PMOS transistor is strongly inverted or it's on, we say that V out will go from zero to VDD in this scenario. And that's exactly what we want. This is good behavior, all right? But let's imagine the opposite scenario. Let's imagine that we connect an NMOS transistor. Let me move it over just a little bit here. We connect an NMOS transistor. And when the NMOS transistor is on, we attach the, the gate to VDD. Okay, now it's trying to pull up. In this case, we're trying to use it for a pull up network. Some voltage on load capacitance V out here. But what is VGS here? Well, VGS is this voltage here. So we know that VGS is actually going to change. So this turns out to be a little bit of a problem. Okay, so this is a problem because VGS is now variable. Okay, so when V out at T equals zero, when we start first start charging the circuit, V out in this case is zero. Okay, so in that case, we say that the NMOS is in, it's on and it's saturated. Okay, because VGS in this case is equal to VDD and uh, VDS is also equal to VDD. And so as a result, CL charges. Okay, so that's all good. However, it can't charge all the way to VDD. When V out reaches VDD minus VT, I'm going to put a little asterisk there that I'll describe 
later, what happens? Well, at this point, VGS is equal to VT. Okay, so at this point, the NMOS, uh, let's delete that, the NMOS, quote unquote, cuts off. Okay, or in other words, it goes into subthreshold. So the NMOS cuts off, which stopping charging. Okay, now I'm going to put a little dagger here. Okay, so what do I mean? Well, technically it's not when V out reaches VDD minus VT because of the body effect. We have to be careful what we mean by VT. And it's not like the device just totally stops charging. We do have subthreshold conduction that happens. And so technically the output will continue to rise in this scenario. And, and, and as a matter of fact, it will rise all the way to VDD if there's no other leakage paths available in the circuit, which frankly is not usually the case, but in this uh, particular example, it would be. And so basically what this means is in practice, if we're operating in general in the above threshold regime, then we can't typically charge all the way to VDD. What we say here is that V out max is equal to VDD minus VTN, asterisk and dagger. Okay, so this is the reason why we don't like having NMOS circuits in the pull up network because they don't pull up very well because VGS is basically directly related to the output. So the summary of this analysis is that NMOSs, NMOS transistors, pass strong zeros and weak ones, whereas PMOS transistors pass strong ones and weak zeros. Okay, so this is uh, an important lesson. Now, we already kind of implicitly said this lesson when we said only use PMOS transistors for pull up and only use NMOS transistors for pull down, but now you know the reason why. So we've already spent a great deal of time talking about uh, static complementary CMOS, so I don't want to belabor the point anymore here. We already know how to build these sort of logic circuits. What I want to do is describe another type of static CMOS circuit called ratioed circuits or ratioed logic. Okay, now just to, to note here, this is still static CMOS, although I do put it in brackets because there are cases where not totally meeting the, the pure definition here, but uh, it's, it's close enough. Okay, so in static complementary CMOS, The sizing of NMOS or PMOS devices might affect the performance of the circuit. It'll definitely affect the speed and pull up uh, or pull down strength and so on. So it might affect the performance, but it won't affect the functionality. Okay, so you could size your PMOS devices to be of size one everywhere and your NMOS devices to be of size thousand, and it'll still work as a logic gate. Now your noise margins and so on may not be good, but functionally, if you have a, if you have a clean input, it will still work as a logic gate. So we say for this reason, it is non-ratioed, or in other words, the sizing doesn't matter. In ratioed, circuits, correct sizing is essential. Okay, so 
what do we mean by that? Well, uh, there's a few different types of interesting ratioed circuits that we can take a look at. So let's take a look at uh, the first one here. This is what we call a resistive load. Okay, so in this circuit we have, well, as the name implies, a resistive load followed by a pull-down network. And this is the output here. This is output Y. So in fact, we actually studied this in one of the homeworks, right? So we said, well, we don't like having those PMOS transistors. Why don't we try putting a resistor there in place? So this technically works, uh, but now in order for the circuit to function correctly, we need the strength of those NMOS transistors to overcome the strength of the resistor in order to pull all of the way down. Similarly, the leakage of the pull-down network must not exceed the normal current carrying capability of that resistor, such that the resistor can pull all the way up. So this was actually how we used to build the very kind of first um, uh, logic circuits uh, when we only had access to NMOS transistors. Now there's a big downside to this kind of circuit that we'll describe momentarily. Now there's a, uh, let me change my color here. There's another uh, circuit uh, or another logic family called NMOS logic. And this was the logic uh, style that was used in the, f in the first uh, digital integrated circuits. And the idea was, it turns out that it's usually kind of hard to build resistors on integrated circuits. So what we can do is instead of having a resistor, we just use an NMOS transistor and use it as an effective resistor. And then we have our normal pull down network here composed of NMOS transistors. The inputs go in over here. Okay. So I should note uh, in, in, in these cases that the um, pull down network is the same as before. So nothing's changed with the pull down network. It's the same as we learned in our static complementary CMOS circuits. Then there's another class of, um, uh, of, of logic gates called pseudo NMOS circuits. Okay, so it turns out that NMOS logic was used when we were building integrated circuits that did not have access to PMOS transistors. So there was not a CMOS design kit uh, it was an NMOS only logic uh, family, okay? So it turns out that with CMOS, we don't have to put an NMOS transistor up there. We know we don't like using NMOS transistors because they're of, of their inability to nicely pass a logic zero, or sorry, a logic one. And so we can kind of create an analog to that. Um, I should label the output here using what we call pseudo NMOS. So it's pseudo NMOS because actually we're using a PMOS at the top, but we're not using a PMOS for a logic computation function. We're just using a, a PMOS to act as basically a load to our circuit. Okay, this is why we call it a pseudo NMOS circuit. All right. So these are three different classes of, of ratioed circuits that we could build. Now, why the heck would we ever do this? Okay, it, if you kind of study the transfer curves and so on, these are not that robust. Uh, there's a, a big issue. Um, uh, let me just write down the disadvantage. Okay, so they're not that robust. Less robust. Um, importantly, they have static power consumption. That was a huge advantage that static complementary CMOS circuits had is that when you were outputting a logic one or a logic zero, if you were outputting a logic one, only the pull up network was on and the pull down network was off. And so therefore there's no current going from VDD to ground other than leakage, of course. And likewise for a logic zero at the output, only the pull down network was on the pull up network was off. And so there's no current going from VDD to ground with the exception of leakage. Now in this case, when we are pulling down, we either have the resistor 
the NMOS logic or that pseudo NMOS transistor there, they're still on. And as a result, there is static current going from VDD through the resistive or the load element through the pull up, through the pull down network and to ground. So we have static power consumption. That is not good news. So you might be asking yourself, why the heck would we do this? Well, there is a benefit and it is a significant benefit in certain applications. Okay. So the benefit of all three of these is it reduces the number of devices. Okay. So in a static complementary logic, we need the same number of transistors for the pull down as we need for the pull up. So if you have a very large complicated logic function in our pull down network, instead of having to replicate an equivalent uh, dual of that logic function in the pull up network with PMOS transistors, which by the way have less mobility, we only have to have one device, a resistor, an, an NMOS a diode connected transistor or pseudo NMOS uh, PMOS transistor. Okay, so this means that the size of our logic gates will be much less. Okay, so that's good. We say smaller size. And in addition, there's less input capacitance. Okay, so as a result, and what we mean by less input capacitance is normally in complementary static CMOS, we have each input connect to both an NMOS in the pull down network and to a PMOS in the pull up network. In this case, we only have to connect to an NMOS in the pull down network. So as a result, we don't have as much capacitance loading our previous gates. So because of that, it's possible we could possibly operate faster. All right, so these are two reasons why we may want to build these kind of ratioed circuits. Now, the, the downsides usually outweigh the benefits, but there are very specific instances in which we actually still today build the circuits, not typically like a resistive load, but more like a pseudo NMOS kind of load. So we do actually use this or a derivative of these circuits in real products today still. All right, so now that we've had an introduction to some of these ratioed circuits, I'd like to take a look at an example. And specifically, I want to look at an example of a pseudo NMOS gate. Okay, and let's just look at the simplest possible example. Let's just look at an inverter. Now you would probably, there, there's not a whole lot of good reasons to build just an inverter. You don't really get a whole lot of the benefits from doing pseudo NMOS, but for the sake of looking at this design example, Let's just consider an inverter. So here's the inputs. Uh, let's say that the uh, transistors have size, um, let's say it's WN for the NMOS transistor and WP for that PMOS transistor. So what I'd like to do is plot the voltage transfer characteristic here. Okay, so this is V out and this is V in. So let's go ahead and draw the case where V in is uh, much larger, or sorry, where W in is much larger than WP. Okay, so let me just uh, label a few points on this plot here, VTN and VDD. Okay, so when, when V in is less than VT of that NMOS transistor, then we say that NMOS transistor is off, which we know to be in subthreshold, but uh, for, for sake of argument, let's just say it's off and there's no current flowing through it. That PMOS transistor, VSG is equal to VDD, so it's on. Uh, and so what we're gonna say is that the output is pretty darn close to VDD, okay? Now, when, when V in starts to exceed the threshold voltage of that NMOS transistor, that NMOS transistor will now start to fight and pull some current uh, uh, down to ground. And that's gonna eventually pull the output low. Okay, so we say this is for when WN is larger than WP. Now, we can actually model this 
we can say that uh, the output voltage VOL is determined. You'll note that I, I didn't show it going all the way to zero here. VOL is determined by an effective resistive divider. Because both devices are on, right? Okay, so we can say this resistive divider looks something like this. There we go. Um, this is the resistance of the PMOS, that's always on. This is the resistance of the NMOS, that's only on if VN is large. And this is V out, which is then given by RN over Rn plus Rp times Vdd, if this input here is Vdd. Okay, so what happens if the width of the NMOS is approximately equal to the width of the PMOS? And let's for, for the moment forget the class sizing convention, let's just say that um, the uh, mobility of PMOS is about equivalent to the mobility of NMOS. Well, what, what that means is both of the transistors, when they both have a full VGS or VSG across them, they're both on and they have the same resistance, so our output is basically going to be VDD over 2. Now, of course, uh, according to the cl class sizing convention, we do have some distinction between the mobility of an NMOS and a PMOS transistor, so that's not entirely true. So I'm going to say that this is when Wn is approximately equal to Wp. And then there's the other scenario where Wp is larger than Wn. We'll say Wp is larger than Wn in this case. And now this is a very poor logic transfer function. Okay, um, so this is not something that we would like to have Wp being larger than Wn. That doesn't really give a good voltage transfer curve. So what this means is that we need Wn to be larger than Wp for this circuit to work reasonably well. So I have a uh, rough rule of thumb for this type of design. The rough rule of thumb says that we want to set the PMOS size to be approximately one quarter of the strength of the NMOS device. And this gives a good balance between be able, being able to pull down the output strongly enough with not having this huge device that has a lot of area and capacitance and, and frankly leakage and so on and so forth, okay? All right, so one question you may be asking yourself is, where the heck would you use a circuit like this? So it turns out that pseudo NMOS circuits is used in a few different locations, uh, but a derivative of a pseudo NMOS circuit is used in memory circuits. Oops. In memory circuits. Um, they are also useful for wide input NOR circuits. Okay, so think about this. If we want to build a large NOR gate in static complementary CMOS, we need a huge stack of PMOS transistors, which we know aren't as good as NMOS transistors. And then we have a large collection of parallel NMOS transistors at the bottom here. Now, because we have to stack this huge stack of PMOS transistors, this means all of these PMOS transistors are gonna be very large, right? Now, instead, if we did this in pseudo NMOS, all we would need is the one PMOS transistor and then our array of NMOS transistors for the pull down network. Okay, so 
if we care about area and we need to compute very large input nor functions, then yeah, pseudo NMOS might be a nice solution or a derivative of it that happens to be a dynamic logic form. But uh, it's a very interesting and, and, and useful uh, tool at our disposal as a digital designer. Now, another type of uh, static logic that we're going to look at today is called cascode voltage switch logic. or CVSL, okay? So many of you might be uh, you know, reading these words and saying, oh no, this sounds like analog design. I'm taking a digital course because I don't want to have to do analog design. Uh, or maybe you're an analog designer and you're like, okay, this is cool, all right. Um, yeah, not quite uh, what you're thinking perhaps. Um, but the, the motivation for CVSL is it seeks the benefit of ratioed circuits, oops, ratioed circuits, but without static power, because that is a major downside of those ratioed circuits. Okay, so it turns out this is a really interesting logic family. What we do is we start out with a circuit that kind of looks like a pseudo NMOS circuit. We have a PMOS header. And then we have some sort of pull down network, computing logic F and ground. Okay, we have our inputs that come in here, one, two, three, as an example. Okay, so, so far I've just drawn what is almost like a pseudo NMOS gate. And then what I'm going to do is I'm gonna add another one of these over here. In this case, rather than compute function f, I'm going to compute function f bar. And then what I'm going to do is something very interesting. I'm going to take the output of this guy and connect it to the output of that guy. This is what's called a cross-coupled pair. Okay, now specifically this output here is now y, and this output we refer to as y bar. All right, uh, and I guess I should uh, specifically mention that uh, these inputs are the same inputs into that circuit over here. Okay, so how does this work? Well, it produces a complementary or IE differential outputs. So we get both outputs Y and Y bar, which can be useful, actually. It's more useful than uh, you might uh, expect, actually. So we will discuss this more when we discuss dynamic circuits. Okay, but um, let's think about how this circuit works a little bit more. How does this actually produce complementary outputs and, and so on? So <clears throat> the best way to perhaps do that is to go through an example. So let's compute the function. Let's build a NAND gate, y equals a b bar. Uh, now, because we're also creating y bar, that means we're also creating an AND gate. So we're simultaneously creating an AND gate and a NAND gate at the same time. Okay, uh, maybe I'll put a little dotted line here to make this more clear. Okay, so let's create this function. So we start the gate design off in the following way. We have our PMOS transistors up here. And specifically, I want to create, uh, in this case, Y bar equals A and B. And so in order to do this, to create an AND gate with NMOS transistors in a pull down network, I want to put A bar and B bar in parallel. Okay. And then on the other side of the logic, I have again my other PMOS transistor here. I want to basically build a normal NAND gate. 
So that looks, well, like normal. So this is A and B. That's my PMOS transistor there. And then I cross-couple these PMOS transistors. This idea of cross-coupling is a super useful and important idea. You're going to see it later on in this course when we talk about sense amplifiers for SRAM arrays. You'll also see it in analog design courses when we build oscillators, when we build positive feedback circuits for creating negative resistance and so on. So it's a really cool uh, technique that you'll see over and over. That's very powerful. Okay, so I've drawn the circuit, but let's just step through and make sure that we understand what this means. Okay, so let's just go through an example. If A equals B equals one, what happens here? Well, we say that Y must be at zero, right? Because the A and B of that uh, right pull down network are both on, so it's pulling Y to zero. All right, um, let me label these two transistors. This is M1 and M2. Okay, so if Y is equal to zero, this must turn M1 on, right? Y is zero, which is connected to the gate of M1. Therefore, VSG of that PMOS transistor is equal to VDD. So if that turns M1 on, this pulls Y bar to logic one. All right, now at the same time, a bar and B bar are both a zero, so the pull down network on the left hand side is not active. So this is good. What this means is that there is no direct path to from VDD to ground. Now, just to be certain, let's go ahead and check M2 in this scenario. Y bar is equal to one. That's connected to the gate of M2. VSG of M2 is now equal to zero. And so therefore M2 is off. So we don't have a direct connection from VDD to ground in this scenario. So now let's took, take a look at another uh, bit example. Let's say if A is equal to one and B is equal to zero. Now in this case, we say that Y bar must be pulled down because A bar in this case is equal to zero. That leftmost NMOS transistor is off but B is equal to zero. Uh, and so B bar is one and that uh, B bar transistor on the second or on the left pull down network is on. So that means Y bar must be at zero. If Y bar is at zero, this will turn uh, M2 on, right? Because Y bar is connected to the gate of M2 VSG of transistor M2 will therefore be equal to VDD and it's going to be on. So this pulls Y to logic one. Okay. Um, and uh, just for uh, completeness, we can then go and look at Y, which is connected to the gate of transistor M1. Therefore, VSG of transistor M1 is equal to zero. So that transistor is off. So again, we've completed the circuit where we no longer have any static DC current paths. So I want to make one note uh, before making uh, before moving on, and that is we will see cross coupled pairs. Uh, a lot later in this course. Now, the final thing I want to make before uh, moving on to the next slide is that you might be asking, why are we doing this? Uh, we now have to double the number of transistors in our pull down networks. We have two, we have an additional PMOS transistor. So one of the reasons we do this is of course, because there's no static DC power consumption. And if we have to compute wide input ORs or, or things like this, there's still an advantage to doing this simply because NMOS transistors are better. Now, if we also then need the complementary signal, if we need to compute 
ors, and nors at the same time, then this is an advantageous structure because we have access to both outputs. Now, with all of that being said, I will say this is probably not the most popular logic technique. We don't use it a lot today. However, we do use a variant of this logic technique that we will discuss in more detail when we get to dynamic circuits. So next I want to move on to another logic family that's actually a really cool one that can be very powerful if, you, if it's used correctly, and that's called pass transistor logic. So the idea with pass transistor logic is rather than trying to have an input go to the gate of a transistor and then pull down to, to ground or pull up to VDD, why don't we allow the input to pass through to the output without having to connect to VDD or ground? So what I mean by that is let's look at an example of an AND gate. Okay, we could construct an AND gate in the following manner. Okay, so we have input A and we connect it to the source or drain, depending on the current direction of an NMOS transistor, and we connect the gate of that NMOS transistor to input B. And then we have input B that connects to that terminal of, the tr of another transistor, and B bar is connected to its gate. And we tie these two together, and this gives us our function F equals AB. So let's try and understand how this works. So first of all, the, or the easiest way to understand a new logic circuit, if you're not familiar, is just draw up a little truth table. Okay, so let's go 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Let's just analyze the case um, for all of these guys. Okay, so when uh, the input is uh, equal to, let's start with 1, 1. Okay, when A is 1 and B is 1, we say that this uh, tr transistor here is going to be on, and we're gonna pass a logic one to the output. So we'll call this path one. Okay, so path one is active, and the output will be logic one. Now on the other hand, if A and B are both equal to zero, then we say that well, B is zero, but B bar is one, so we're gonna say that this path here is on. So this we'll call path two, and we'll say in this case, path two is on, and the input to path two is a logic zero, so F is going to be zero, okay? Now in the case where A is zero, but B is one, we say that we're going to go through that upper path because that upper path has B at its gate, B is one, and so therefore that gate is on. The input to that gate is zero, so we're gonna get a zero pass, oops, let me write that in black here. We're gonna get a zero pass through to the output. And likewise, when A is one, but B is zero, we're gonna say that B bar is on, the lower path is on, so that's path two but the input to the lower path in this case is zero, so we get a zero at the output. And indeed, the truth table works out. This is the truth table for a AND gate. Now you can go through this and uh, make sure and convince yourself that indeed path one or two is on, and whenever path one or two is, is on, the other path you can convince yourself is off. So the benefit to doing this there's actually a huge benefit to building an AND gate like this. If we were to build an AND gate with static complementary CMOS, we would need six transistors, four transistors to build an AND gate, and then two transistors to build an inverter. So the benefit is there are way fewer transistors here. To implement the logic function. So that's a huge benefit, okay? If you wanna build very compact logic, then this is a really good candidate. Now, there is a problem. There are multiple problems, okay? The biggest problem to this technique is that while well, these are NMOS transistors, and as we know, NMOS transistors will not pass a strong logic one. So it's VDD minus VT zero, plus gamma times square root of 
2 phi f plus v out minus root 2 phi f. Okay, so that sucks. All right, what's the solution? So we know that NMOS transistors don't pass a strong logic one, but they do pass kind of a logic one. It's VDD minus VT effectively, right? So one possible solution is we can add an inverter. So if we generate VDD minus VT and VDD happens to be larger than VT, then it'll take the output that is at VDD minus VT and basically amplify it up. Um, however, this is not a great solution because it may result, depending on what VDD is, may result in static power because the PMOS may be on um, in this case. Okay, so that's also not desirable. So it turns out that there's a much better set of solutions that we will study momentarily. But before we do that, I want to issue a warning. And I want to issue this warning through uh, an example of two separate circuits. Let's have a circuit with input A. And it has two NMOS transistors in series here with inputs B and C. And then we take that output and pass it through an inverter. Okay, let's call this circuit one. All right, and this is node X and this is node Y. Now I wanna compare that to another circuit which has input A into transistor controlled by B. And then we take the output of this circuit and connect it to C to create an output like this. Okay, so we'll call this circuit two and this is node X and node Y. Okay, and the question I want to ask is, which has worse swing on Y? This is a, a really good question. Uh, a lot of people get a little tripped up by this. Okay, so let's go and analyze this for problem one. Um, in this case, what will Y be in the worst case when A, B, and C are all equal to one? Well, we know that B, or sorry, node X can charge up to VDD minus VT, right? Now that's gonna be acting as the other terminal to transistor C, which is charging Y up. Uh, but in this case, Y can also only charge to VDD minus VT, which happens to be the same voltage on the other side of the transistor. Uh, and so we can say that Y in this case can indeed charge to VDD minus VT. This is good, okay? But for circuit two, we know that X can charge to VDD minus VT. But now this is being used as the gate of the NMOS transistor. The gate of the NMOS transistor is already at VDD minus VT. So therefore the largest that node Y can charge to is now whatever the gate voltage is minus VT. So that results in VDD minus two VT, okay? Which is approximately equal to 0 0.2 volts in 45 nanometer. This is supposed to be a logic one. It's supposed to be VDD, and because we now have two VT drops, our logic one is now 0 0.2 volts. So this was supposed to be logic one. But we have failed dramatically, okay? So between these two circuits, option one is better but it's still not a great option because we have that VT drop. So we'd like to somehow do better. We need a better solution to this problem. So we, we were, uh, we're saying we need a better solution. So let me propose a couple different ones. Solution 
1. Now this solution may be obvious to some of you, but if it's not, uh, let's just go through it and make sure everybody understands. It's called a transmission gate. Okay, and this is probably the easiest and possibly best solution that we have available to us. So if we know that NMOS transistors are not good at passing logic ones, why don't we add a PMOS transistor? That should solve everything, right? So we have our NMOS transistor, then what we do is we just add a PMOS transistor in parallel. So if this is, <clears throat> excuse me, B, then we add a PMOS transistor whose gate input is B bar. Okay, and this is output Y. Some people will draw the transmission gate symbol as follows. Um, the best way, I guess, to do it is to draw two um, back-to-back um, triangles like this. So A, B, put a little circle there to indicate this is a complementary input, B bar, and Y. Okay, so the main idea with this is that when, um, or rather, let's plot the um, effective resistance of this gate, resistance R, versus the output voltage V out. <clears throat> now, if we have a NMOS transistor only, when V out is low, we know that NMOS transistors pass a strong logic zero. Therefore, that means that the resistance is very low. So we say that we have a low resistance over here. And then as V out starts to increase and the device goes into subthreshold, or yeah, subthreshold, then the effective resistance Rn starts to increase. Now, likewise, with the PMOS transistor, the situation is basically the opposite, right? So it'll look something like this. So the PMOS is good when the output voltage is close to zero, or sorry, when the output voltage is high, but not so good when it's low, okay? So the effective parallel combination of these two circuits looks something like this. And there's not a huge variation, Rn in parallel with Rp across the output range, okay? So what this does is it gives us approximately constant resistance over the entirety of the voltage swing that the gate might experience. All right, excellent. All right, so what I'd like to do is I'd also want to offer a design tip. And it might be a little counterintuitive. What I'd like to suggest is that you size devices to be equal. When 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 they are on. So what I mean by this is that when the device is on, and let's say we're passing a logic zero. Okay. So we're modeling this as two resistors in parallel, the NMOS is on top and the PMOS is on the bottom. So when we're passing a logic zero, we say the NMOS is good and therefore its resistance will be approximately R if it's of size one. Actually, let me uh, draw this in green here. So RN will be approximately R because the NMOS in this scenario is good. All right. Now the PMOS, as we know, is not good at passing a logic zero. Okay, so we say the PMOS transistor, it nominally has, according to the class sizing convention, double the amount of resistance, but because we are now passing a logic zero, which it's not good at, we'll say it's approximately 4R um, because PMOS passes zero poorly. Normally it's 2R, but in this case, we're gonna say it's um, 4R. So the effective resistance in this case, R effective is equal to R in parallel with 4R, which is equal to four over five 
R. Okay, so it's still actually a little bit lower than if we just had the NMOS transistor operating alone. So now let's look at the opposite scenario where we have trying to pass a logic one. We have our NMOS transistor on top, our PMOS transistor on the bottom, as follows. Okay, so we say that Rn in this scenario is approximately equal to 2R because NMOS is not good at passing a logic one. On the other hand, the PMOS is good, uh, but we, we've sized it to be of size one, and so RP is approximately equal to 2R because the PMOS is good at passing a logic one here. So the effective resistance in this case, R effective, is equal to the parallel combination of 2R and 2R, which is just equal to R. Okay, so in this case, we have R or 4 over 5R, which is eh, pretty close to R, maybe a little bit better. Um, and so this is the reason why I suggest sizing the devices to be equal size when they're on, rather than use, using the class sizing convention to upsize that size of that PMOS transistor. It turns out you don't gain much by doing so. So it turns out pass transistor logic is actually quite fun. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting gates that we can make out of pass transistor logic using kind of weird arrangements that you wouldn't normally see in static complementary CMOS. So let's just imagine the following circuit here. So I have A, C, C bar. So I'm gonna take one pass transistor and I'm gonna connect it to another set of pass transistors over here, or in this case, I guess, uh, transmission gates, to create an output F here, okay? So question is, what is this logic function? Question. What function is this? Well, we can go ahead and draw a truth table, but uh, let's just kind of look at it and, and we should be able to figure out what this is just by looking at it. So if C is one, if C equals one, then the upper transmission gate turns on and F equals A. If on the other hand, C is equal to zero, then the lower transmission gate turns on while the upper one turns off. And so F is equal to B. Okay, so this is a multiplexer. So it's a very simple way to build a multiplexer using transmission gate logic. Let's look at another one. Let's have even more fun with this one, if that's possible. I know the last one was so fun. So let's take an input A and let's go to an inverter-like symbol, but I'm gonna make one important change to this inverter-like gate. <clears throat> and specifically that change is rather than connect it, the, the source here to ground, I'm gonna connect it to a logic value. I'm gonna connect it to B bar and I'm gonna connect it to B on the top. And then I'm gonna do something even more funky. I'm gonna take another transmission gate over here. You should put solder balls uh, everywhere if you're being precise about your technical drawings. A, B bar, and this is a PMOS transistor and input B goes here. And we'll take this as the output of our circuit Y. Okay, so very funky looking gate. So if we don't uh, understand what gate, what function this is, so question is, what is the function of this gate? Then perhaps the best thing to do is draw a truth table. This will help us identify what's going on. So we have A, B, Y, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. Okay, so let's take a look at the case when A is zero and B is zero. So B is zero means the quote unquote VDD of this first inverter like structure is zero. So we're definitely not gonna pass a logic one. 
B bar is one, so that bottom NMOS transistor is not going to turn on, so that, that circuit's gone. Uh, so we must be dealing with the transmission gate on the left. And indeed, if B is zero, this transmission gate is on, because B bar is one, that NMOS transistor is on. B is um, zero, so the PMOS transistor is on, so we have a path from A to the output. We'll call this path one. In this case, um, the output uh, is just A, which is equal to zero. So we say we have zero, and this is coming from path one. Okay, very good. So what about when A is zero and B is one? When B is one, we say that that top uh, VDD-like terminal of the left inverter is on. A is zero, so that PMOS transistor is now on. So we now have a path that's going this way through to the output. We'll call this path two. So in this case, path two is on. It's connecting the output to B, which is logic one. And so therefore the output is equal to logic one. Okay. Now what about the case when A is equal to one and B is equal to zero? If B is zero, the power supply of the left inverter is collapsed. So it's not functioning, but that transmission gate is on. In this case, the transmission gate is on and it's passing A through to the output. So this is passing through path one and the output is going to be one. Okay, there's only one path that hasn't been explored. So hopefully it will turn on this time. When A is one and B is one, then we say the inverter is working as an inverter. B bar is equal to zero. So the ground like terminal of that inverter is indeed ground. And in this case, A is one, so that NMOS transistor is on. So this NMOS transistor is gonna pull down the output. We'll call this path three. It's gonna pull down the output to logic zero. So now we should be able to answer what logic function this is, just based on the truth table. This is an XOR circuit, okay? And in fact, this is one of the lowest complexity Uh, implementations of an XOR circuit. Uh, and in fact, this is a, a nice interview question that some companies like to ask when they are uh, looking to hire new engineers. They like to ask people, can you design the lowest complexity XOR circuit? Now I want to issue a word of warning with our transmission gates. I specifically want to describe the delay through transmission gates or T gates to abbreviate them. So let's consider the scenario where we're gonna build all of our logic functions out of transmission gates and we have a long string of logic. Well, what we can do is we can model our transmission gate as being a resistor, you know, some effective resistance, whatever parallel combination of the NMOS and the PMOS uh, with a shunt capacitor at the output. Let's call this R and let's call this C. And we have a, a collection of these that are turning on to create some logic function R and C. And then more R and more C. Okay, and then let's say that this here is V out. So one question you might ask is, how do we calculate the delay through this circuit? Let's say this is super long, you know, there's N uh, logic stages in here. How do we cal calculate the delay through the circuit? Well, the way to do it is, as we've always done, with an Elmore delay model. Okay, so it turns out that the delay, tau, uh, all the way to get to, from Vn to Vout, is equal to, it's a summation, actually. We sum from I equals zero to capital N, where N is the number of stages. Um, and that's uh, C times R times I. Okay, so remember the Elmore delay equation. We take the capacitance and then we multiply by the shared resistance along the path to the output. So the very last capacitor has all of the resistance across of across it shared to the output there. 
um, and uh, as a result, it gets multiplied by um, by the largest amount of resistance, and so on and so forth. So if you remember your uh, mathematical identities uh, or your mathematical formulas for summations, you'll you'll remember, uh, and I, you know you might have to look this up, but I'll just say it. Uh, if you remember, the summation of this uh, series can be described as CR times n times n plus one over two. Okay. So in other words, the delay is quadratically proportional to n. It's proportional to n squared. All right. So what this means is that the more stages we add, we get quadratically worse delay. Now you'll recall that's not the case with normal um, complementary CMOS logic. As we add more and more stages, we should get a delay that's proportional to n, not to n squared. Okay. So this is a major disadvantage of transmission gates. One of the proposed solutions is to build what we call a buffered chain. So will this will this help us? All right. Uh, and so the idea is we have our transmission gates, which we like. They're, they're a nice way to build a logic function in a very compact area. But we know that we can't have too many of these in series, otherwise we have a large delay. So what, what I say here is that let's put only m of them in series. And then after m, let's put a buffer. OK, and then we have another m. I'm only drawing this as two, but you know you get the idea that this could be multiple gates. And then another buffer, and so on. So n is the total number of t gates. And M, as in Michael, is the number of gates per section. Okay. So in this case, I'm going to calculate the actual propagation delay. I'm going to keep around this log two um, number just uh, um, so I can calculate this uh, per, uh, numerically. Uh, log two times N over M times CR times m m plus 1 over 2. Okay, so what this means is that we have n total T gates and we divide them into sections of m. So we have n over m of these each time CR times m plus m times m plus 1 over 2, um, where that is the Elmore delay of one set of these guys. Now we also, of course, have the delay of n over m minus one buffers. So we have to include the delay of these buffers. So we can simplify this a little bit. This is equal to log two times CRN times M plus one over two plus N over M minus one times T buff. And now what we want to do is we want to set this up as an optimization problem. How large do we want M to be given a fixed length of N? Okay, and so the best way to do this is we take the derivative of uh, the propagation delay with respect to M and set it to zero. So how do we decide the value of M? So it turns out that the optimum M is equal to 1.7 times the square root of the delay of the buffer divided by RC. And if you compute that into real numbers, this is approximately a number of three to four in current CMOS technologies. Okay, so now the real benefit of doing all of this is now delay is only proportional to n, no longer to n squared. Okay, so this is the, the, the real advantage of doing a buffer chain. So if you are going to build an entire circuit using transmission gates, you do need to put buffers in there 
in order to, to make sure you don't have too large of paths and therefore your circuits are extremely slow. Now buffers, what are they? They're just two inverters you know, in cascade with each other. Or if you keep track of the logic, you can just use one inverter, but just know that it then becomes an inverted value. So you might have remembered a couple slides ago, I actually listed something as solution one. Uh, transmission gates were solution one. That implies that there must be other solutions possible here. Um, and indeed, that's the case. There are a couple other solutions I want to uh, describe. So let's finally go to solution two. Okay, we just spent a lot of time talking about transmission gates because they are an important and probably the best uh, solution. But I do want to introduce these other um, solutions uh, because we may look at them, particularly this one, a little bit later for some other applications. So what this is, is called a level restoring transistor. All right, so the idea here is we have our NMOS transmission gate as input A, it's NMOS only. Uh, so I guess it's not a transmission gate, it's a pass transistor. And input B is here. So we note, well, this node has a little bit of parasitic capacitance. Then we said, well, let's go ahead and put an inverter after this signal, and that'll help a little bit. But the cool idea here is if this is V out, what we can do is we can take V out and we can feed it back. Okay, specifically, we feed it back to what we call as the name implies, a level restoring transistor. It's a PMOS transistor that looks something like this. All right, let's make a few labels here. We'll call this transistor MR, and this node is node X. So let's go ahead and plot what happens in this case. So if, um, uh, let's say that this is, um, well, let's do this versus time, and let's say this is V out. And let's say that V in was one, and now it's going to, or sorry, V in was zero, and now it's going to logic one. So if the size of MR is very small, what we're gonna say is initially, we're at logic one, um, and I guess, sorry, I'm, yeah. Um, initially we're at logic one, and then we're gonna pull, in fact, all the way down, okay? The reason we pull all the way down is because when V, uh, when V out goes to zero, that is activating the gate of transistor MR, which pulls node X all the way to VDD, which strongly turns on the NMOS transistor within that inverter, and therefore pulls V out all the way to ground. Okay, we say this when WR is small. All right, WR does not have to be big. Remember, the only reason we're doing, we're adding that circuit there is because once X gets close to VDD minus VT, it's no longer getting pulled th up through that first NMOS transistor connected to A and B there. So the only purpose for MR is, is it's a high impedance node at that point, basically. Um, and it just needs to be a tiny little transistor that pulls it all the way up to VDD. Now, things get nasty if you actually make um, WR to be too big. Okay, so this would be the case when WR is too big. Now the reason this happens is if WR is too big, then this means it's hard for the state of this circuit to kind of flip, all right? So if V out was at logic one, which implies that X is at logic zero, then we need to make sure that um, uh, the, the node X can overcome the feedback that's being driven uh, through the inverter back through that PMOS transistor. So what this means is that sizing is critical. 
And as a result, this means this circuit is uh, ratioed logic. Okay, so we don't typically use level restoring transistors. It turns out we'll use level restoring transistors for some other solutions that we may talk about later on in this course. But uh, it is a solution here, but frankly, a transmission gate probably works better. Now, the final solution I'll want to describe here, solution three, is if we have a VT issue, why don't we just use zero VT devices? That could solve all of our problems. Well, not so fast. So it turns out, yes, there are zero VT devices available in some process technologies. Not all of them have them, um, but they are available in some technologies, that's fine. So imagine the following scenario. Let's imagine we're building a MUX. Okay, so we have um, two inverters that are driving our signals um, that then go into our zero VT devices. And I'm specifically going to uh, put an extra black line here to indicate this is a zero VT device. Extra black line here. This is also a zero VT device. And we connect our outputs and pass this through an inverter. Okay, so very good. So this looks like it could be fine. These are NMOS transistors, but they have zero VT. So therefore the output could drive all the way up to VDD minus VT. If VT is zero, it just uh, drives all the way to VDD. Problem solved. Mm, not so fast. So what happens if our inputs here are zero, one, one, and zero? Let's take a look at what happens. So if this is zero, this PMOS transistor is gonna be on. So we're driving a logic one through this circuit, and that makes it all the way through to the output. So that's, gr that, that's great, okay? Pro that has solved a bit of this problem. Now the issue is that when we have logic zero tied to the gate of this NMOS transistor, it's not really totally off, right? VGS uh, is equal to, you know, um, if, if VGS minus VT, if VT is zero, then even with zero volts across the gate to source voltage of this transistor, it's barely turned off, okay? And so as a result, we can also have leakage or we can also have current that goes this way. Okay, so what we call this is watch out for what we call sneak leakage paths. Okay, so I don't recommend doing this method. It is possibly an option, but you have to be very careful about these uh, so-called sneak leakage paths. So. We did go over through these extra two possible solutions. Again, yeah, the best possible, the, probably the best solution here is just to use a transmission gate. It's much simpler. Uh, again, you have to be careful about long logic paths and so on, but this is probably the best solution for most practical scenarios.